The world can change music. Can music change the world? Well, I think that I think that music's always changed the world. Um, before, it's funny. I had this discussion with a woman from Sweden for a Swedish magazine just like two hours ago. We talked to her about this. The problem, the problem is, is that people have forgotten that if you work with children and teach them music, it opens up certain parts of their brain when they're young, which also enables them to become better mathematicians and. And it opens up all kinds of other avenues of the, of the mind. Um, so now, in let's say America, the first thing they're doing is getting rid of music programs and these things that really they don't realize that enlighten children to make children better at everything else. And so, can music change the world? It, it's like the governments of the world are doing everything possible. They they don't think that the arts they don't understand the importance of the arts anymore. And without the arts, so many other things don't happen. That's why we have a bunch of morons in government that only think about, you know, dollars and they forget. And so maybe music won't be able to change the world if the governments and everyone keeps voting for it, keeps getting rid of all the music programs, you know, because then you get stuck with mindless. I mean, that's why kids now don't even go see live bands. They go stand in front of a DJ. And no offense, I have a lot of friends that are hot DJs. But if you go, when I was a kid, and you get the live experience of Led Zeppelin or, or Aerosmith or, or uh, Earth, Wind & Fire or Kiss or somebody, it was in, like the whole thing was like live theater. Was, or even going to theater. When you go to a club now and you stand in front of a DJ, you're not even watching because he's just standing there doing this and you're just kind of looking, everybody's looking at each other. But it, it's, it, you completely... What's a, what's a good, another good question? Don't give me that correct second question, it's kind of crazy. No. <laughs> okay. okay. What are the benefits of an extraordinary musician and the disadvantages? I don't know. I don't even know what that means because it's like... Most of the musicians that I think are fantastic, you would not think are fantastic. Well, there's just like another level, like you have the, the, the Mozart and you know these type of things, which are those were true, like beyond. They could hear everything in their head and write it out and know the harmonies. Uh, you got you got these guys that are nowadays they have exceptional skill from studying and don't necessarily reach somebody's soul. And someone might say they're a super musician, but I don't know if that's really true. Maybe they're super good at, you know, if a guy knows how to dig a hole really good, he can, if he practices enough, he can dig a perfect hole, and I think it's the same with music. A lot of people confuse that type of musician as a perfect musician. Um, what was the end of that question again about? The, 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 the disadvantages of being an extraordinary well, musician. Yeah, so I don't know what the advantage the advantages are is that you could sit down like if I was a super guitarist player, like people think I'm a super guitar player, right? I think I have moments that I channel something and it really can like uh, something else. And then I have moments where it's just like it's awful. And I think Jimmy not to compare myself to Jimi Hendrix, but I remember watching Jimi Hendrix at Isle of Wight. And you can't tell me he's not a super musician, but he was horrible at Isle of Wight, right? So I think the great guys they just get into a zone and it works. Then you have these guys that are super consistent. Um, that people would say are super musicians. I'm in the magazines with lots of those people, but I always find those people to be maybe just, they're super good at practicing. So the advantages of being a super musician are you can probably always get someone to pay, pay to come see you play. But does it mean you have a career? And the disadvantages of being a super musician maybe are, even for me, some people that don't know my music, they know that I'm kind of a street guy, they know about me, they assume I'm some guitar hero and I'm gonna be like Steve Vai or something. Not, I think Steve Vai's fantastic, by the way. And so they come to see me and they go, oh my God, you're like, your music's like punk rock funk or something. I had no idea, I thought you were gonna be doing, I mean, somebody said to me last night or two nights ago in Vienna, um, maybe it was last night, they, they said, oh, he plays, with, he wasn't using all this technique. They expect to come see me trying all these different techniques out, like a, Uli John Roth or something, and it's like, I don't do that. I don't even know what any of that is. So. so the disadvantages of that is some people don't listen to the music they see, hear about somebody like myself, and assume that I'm one of those guys. So, but I'd rather have the advantage of it than this. You know, I'd rather, it works out in my favor either way. It's, uh, I don't want to complain, but that is the disadvantage is that people assume that maybe you're like 
you're a square or you're like you're not a hip hip and cool guy you know so I have to go do a cool record with a DJ or something so everyone thinks I'm super cool good from Mozart to Marilyn Manson or Lady Gaga the messages of our favorite musicians and singers influence our lives what musician has influenced you in your life James Brown Sex Machine. Is it rolling now? I will, I, will, I will add that I don't know why you put Marilyn Manson in that sentence. Marilyn Manson, he's a, he's a poser. questions. <laughs> <laughs> What would the best musical human meeting be that you've had so far in your career? There's been a, there have been a bunch of them. Um, obviously, the first, my first, well, when I was a kid in high school, I dated Tammy Wynette's daughter, the country singer, and I got to spend a lot of time with Tammy Wynette, who was a true legend, and she really inspired inspired me a lot. And her husband George Ritchie. Um, when you meet legends, you often find. That there's, it's not an accident why they're legends. There's something about them. I was standing one time on the side of the stage at the Greek Theater in L.A., backstage, but on the side, and I was watching um, Bella Fleck and the Flecktones play. And I remember starting to feel uncomfortable, like, ah, I'm feeling all this tension in my neck. I'm watching the guy play, and I'm feeling this tension. And I'm like, ah, what's wrong? And I looked next to me, and Sting was standing next to me. And I swear to God, he had some kind of radical magnetic energy that just was like giving me a backache. It was weird, but it was like he was just standing there all being sting, you know? So these, a lot of these guys have some kind of something that when they walk in a room, everybody has to stare. You don't even know why you do it. So I've had a lot of these type of meetings. I started with Tammy Wynette and obviously moving to L.A. and meeting George Clinton. George, George knew enough to meet, meeting me and to, to, to ask me to work with him, just purely on a, I said hello, and George just knows things, and George George changed my life, and, but to be around George was like, wow, to watch complete freedom, like, must have been, around, it must have been like standing with Jackson Pollock watching him paint George Clinton when he was creating music, and um, after that, of course, Thomas Dolby was, was an amazing person to be around just because he was, he was like, you could tell he was like a human computer. It was like, not a bad human computer, but somebody that was on a whole other level of searching for the human thing and understanding the mad technology of it. Thomas Dolby was one of those real guys like that. Um, Bootsy Collins, because Bootsy thinks on a whole other level as well, but he's also super warm. Bootsy was like a real big brother. Like I got an email from Bootsy today where he said uh, something about, I was thinking about my heart, and you're a part of my heart, and I just wanted you to know, like he sent these incredible and cool messages, like Bootsy College, you know? So, you know, and then uh, the producer, David Kirshenbaum, who I became a staff producer for, I, you know, he did Joe Jackson and Tracy Chapman. He connected with me, and he made me a staff producer when I was nobody, and really, I learned a lot from him. And, and I felt like he learned a lot from me in a way, not, or not learned from me, but he was smart enough to know that I, I, I was onto something that he didn't understand. So he put me in a position to excel and, and would come in and it's like, the smart guys always surround themselves with the great smart guys, not the, and the stupid ones always surround themselves with the, with the guys who just tell them what they want to hear, right? Um, after that, of course, Rod Stewart. You know, you can say what you want about Rod. I mean, I love him. You know, he, he can be a bit of an asshole, but, but he was like a big brother to me and a father figure to me. And he taught me so much about how to play a football stadium. And there's an art to playing a giant stadium, you know. Um, Mick Jagger, incredible, incredible. Just to be on. Keith Richards, and be on. Justin Timberlake, just recently, when I worked with Justin and T.I. on Dead and Gone. Justin Timberlake, I went to the studio thinking, ah, Justin Timberlake's just some boy band guy. I, I thought he was talented. I thought he was charismatic. I, I didn't think much of him, like, as far as a musician. And um, he blew my mind. We were working on these things, and he would sit at the piano, and he goes, what are you... 
But we're not filming it. Don't you? No. I'll ask the question first. Okay. Ready? Okay. Right. What are your thoughts about music in Europe, in America, and elsewhere? Globalization has made it to where it's kind of hard to go and find any real culture anymore, um, anywhere. I mean, when I first started coming to Europe, I moved to England first to get my record deal out of high school. And they only had four TV channels. And then, you know, Sky TV started. I went, I moved to Holland. And when you'd go to these countries, they would have their own clothes, their own shoes, their own uh, style, and their own music, and their own things that were restored to them, influenced by other things, um, which I found really fascinating and inspiring. Now, with globalization, it's sort of like everybody wears the same pair of Nikes. Everybody looks like they're in the same hip hop video. Everybody looks like, you know, it's just like, and all the mom and pop designers and clothing designers, and those people are out of business. And the same with the artists. The artists are, everybody wants to sound like whatever they're watching on one channel. You know, you know, there's, but the good thing about Europe, and the same thing with Japan, perhaps even Australia, um, is that in Asia and in, in, in Europe, they appreciate the arts. So they can look at somebody who's doing something weird or bizarre, something that I might even think is shit, but and find some truth in it or some lack of truth in it and say it's bullshit as well, just like you would a painter or anybody else. And therefore a guy like me, or Bernard Fowler, or some of those guys who work with the biggest people in the world, but we don't necessarily, you know, I've sold a couple million albums, I haven't sold 20 million albums. But I can still go over to Europe and play a concert, even if it's in front of 200 kids, you know what I mean? And, and people will pay for that, um, because they appreciate an artist, I believe, and understand that if somebody's real, it's worth for them to go see it, and they don't have to necessarily be on the radio. Now in America, it's become so, Everything has become so corporately owned and money driven that you know one, two companies own all the radio stations and a couple of companies own all the record companies and it's like they don't know what they're doing and therefore they they just go this thing sold so let's get another thing just like it that sold and, and there's no real art involved because there's no artist development and when I first started you know you had all these pop stars they were always there. But you also had all this development area, which was FM radio, and you could develop your art. And, and, and Chris Blackwell put it best. I remember because I was signed to Island Records, and he had signed U2. And he said, if, if I don't make, he was making all these weird records with Bill Laswell and making all these weird records, you know, um, just bizarre records that some were shit and some were amazing. But he says, I gotta make these kind of records, even if they don't sell, because this, one or two of these artists, is going to influence some young kid who's going to turn out to be the next U2. You know what I mean? U2 was definitely listening to weirder bands and all kinds of stuff to create something to become the biggest band in the world. And now they influence other bands, right? So now, how do you have a new U2? That's why we all still go see the old bands. We all, everyone will still pile at the stadium to go see, um, you know, whoever. Uh, even people want to even go see Guns N' Roses and ain't even Guns N' Roses anymore. You know, and it's because they want something that was there that you don't get now because there's no artist development. And so in America, the lack of artist development is killing the business. It's, in an, there's, you know, we talk about this, you know, a young artist like yourself, where do you go? You, you know, when I was young, a record company would say, okay, Stevie, you're pretty creative. Here's 20,000 bucks. Just go in the studio and just be creative for a while. Let's see what you get, uh, come up with. Now it's sort of like, man, you have to deliver like some kind of song that has to get on the radio immediately and has to, and the radio is only going to play it because it sounds like something they're already playing and, and there's it's just no way they are, it's, to be creative. And as long as everything is corporate driven, and, and you can say, oh, we have the internet now that gives you freedom, but it's bullshit. The internet's complete bullshit because it has no filter. And I don't care what anyone says. I, I got into a discussion in Australia with this lady um, who worked for a museum and I work with the Smithsonian. And, and she goes, I can't, you know, you can't judge art. And I go, bullshit, you can't judge art. I think some art is shit, some art is great. I and mean, that's the whole idea. Otherwise, everybody could just throw shit against the wall like Jackson Pollock and it would be worth a fortune. There's got to be some sort of a structure there. And uh, the, the, there's, 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 the internet is just like, what makes a stock worthless 
for your company if you're if you have a company that's on the Nasdaq or something is that there's too much stock in the street and your stock goes down. Well, there's too much music out. There's too much shit music out, and you can't blame the artist because the artist always thinks what they're working on is the coolest shit ever. They do. That's the natural thing. You have to be confident, right? It's that's it's becoming so like uh, smaller and smaller and smaller. So I don't know if music can change the world if government people keep getting rid of any music programs that. Uh, and there's no way to develop the arts. So. Good job. <laughs> you can cut that steak.